Welcome to the third webinar in the CCC RSI webinar series. Uh, we're happy to have you. We know that you will be uh, trickling in uh, by the dozens and scores and hundreds. So welcome to our three presenters. I will be introducing them in just a moment. Uh, as we're uh, trickling or flooding in, we're already up to more than 350, uh, I will uh, just briefly say who we are and who I am. I'm Marjorie Bancroft. I'm the uh, director and founder of Cross-Cultural Communications. Uh, we have a couple of staff members on hand who will be assisting us and our presenters. Um, you, yes, there are CUs for ATA and CCHI for the webinar. Um, yes, your, your good morning. Your, your, uh, your, feel free to chat as you come in. Um, I will issue this reminder one more time, but if you could use the chat primarily for greetings or administrative questions or questions to CCC, and could you direct your questions to the panelists, the, our speakers here, it, using Q&A function? Uh, I will remind you again. We also uh, want to share that there's so many attending today uh, that we will not be able to answer every question, but we will do our best uh, at the end of 45 minutes. Uh, this series, by the way, goes on. This is the third in the series. There will be at least two more, and we're actually, um, we may be adding um, a sixth one just in the RSI series. So right now, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers just super briefly uh, because they will introduce themselves. We are now up to 560, but there are more coming in, so I know you're not all quite here yet. But let's get started. Uh, you have three federally court certified uh, interpreters and state court, uh, California, um, Virginia, and Iowa, who are your expert presenters. Uh, I have to be careful about saying veterans in the field because it makes them sound old and they are nevertheless senior and absolutely experienced. Um, I have to say that Tambor is uh, fascinating in part because of her background in refugee resettlement, having lived in Thailand. Amy is a staunch member and board member, in fact, of the uh, National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and uh, Translators, a tireless advocate. And Ernest has a fascinating background um, in Anthro, a degree in anthro linguistics. I'm a fellow linguistics nerd, so of course I love that. And among his, his many accomplishments, I just have to read this. This is my favorite part of your bio. Ernest is a Jeopardy champion of 2012 whose greatest achievement on the show was beating an attorney to the buzzer to answer co-defendant in the 11 words category. Uh, without further ado, uh, just before I hand off, one last reminder, general comments or questions to CCC, please, in the chat, questions to the presenters for the last 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, if you would kindly use the Q&A feature for questions to the presenters. Um, and without further ado, please have a wonderful presentation, all three of you. Tambor, Amy, and Ernest, the show is yours. Hey, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and start my share. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're really glad to be here um, to present about uh, interpreting in the courts and legal arena during COVID-19. And uh, so again, just briefly who we are. Um, I am federally certified court interpreter, very new actually. I just got certified in the last round, so that's been a big deal for me. Uh, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. with a strong background in immigration court interpreting and uh, refugee resettlement, both on the interpreting side as well as on the uh, services uh, and, and aid side. Um, I'll let Amy quickly say a couple of words. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I think uh, Marjorie said pretty much uh, what I would have said to introduce myself as a court interpreter and also my special interest is in agricultural interpreting. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And Ernest. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. In addition to the great introduction Marjorie gave me, um, a fun fact is at the moment, in addition to my remote work for court, I am on the air several times a week with our local PBS station interpreting our governor's bi-weekly press conferences 
over the air on secondary audio. So that's been a wonderful challenge and uh, really enjoying it. All right. All right, and together, um, we, we've been working together a lot. Like part of the reason why we're so excited about remote interpreting in the courts is because the three of us have been working together to really learn uh, about remote technology, um, particularly Zoom, but also uh, investigating a lot of other platforms. And so we've been teaching and training together and we have this new thing that we're calling uh, TEA language solutions um, to continue to help kind of share uh, the, the knowledge around technology that we all need to have right now in order to succeed in, um, in, in court interpreting in a remote environment. So that's kind of how the three of us came together uh, for this presentation. Uh, so what are we going to be talking about? Uh, so I will start by discussing the general situation in courts across the United States. Uh, and I will also uh, kind of briefly, because I know we have an international audience, uh, so I'll kind of briefly talk about some cool stories that I've heard from around the world. So mostly headlines, obviously not direct experience, but it just kind of goes to show how the whole world is in this and courts all over the world are doing this. It's not just the US. Um, Ernest will be talking about some of the specific solutions and that he has personally worked with uh, and how those have worked, kind of pros and cons. And, and it's all been kind of an evolution and an experimentation process. So we're going to try and reflect that for you all as well, that this is where we started and this is where we all are now, but we still have a ways to go. And that's where Amy is going to come in uh, and talk to you about you know, where can we, what can we really do to make this continue to evolve, to make it better uh, for everyone uh, as, we, as we move forward and continue to experiment all together as, as court interpreters, as legal interpreters, and as interpreters in, in any other field. So I kind of first wanted to address why court is special, why it's different, why it's not just so easy as um, talking to, you know, your conference clients and, and things like that, like, oh, we're going to just do this, here's, here's the solution and implement, boom. Actually, there's a lot, there are a lot of barriers that courts are dealing with, and it's actually quite impressive that they've come so fast so far. Um, first of all, courts are not dealing with just themselves. Uh, when it comes to implementing remote, they have to get buy-in from uh, detention centers, they have to get buy-in from probation agencies, they have to get buy-in from public defender's offices, from the private bar, from prosecutors. They have to get everybody to work together and they have to get everybody to be on board with using the, the equipment. Uh, there are also regulatory and legal barriers that courts have had to take down and take down very quickly. Uh, in order to be able to even allow people to appear not in person. So all of these administrative barriers are things that have kept courts from uh, being able to just, okay, we have a problem, let's launch. So I wanted to recognize that, um, particularly that it's not like, oh, well, why, why didn't this happen faster? I mean, it's amazing how fast it did happen. Uh, there's other issues such as um, due process issues. Uh, we have to be in, in the US, we have a right to a public trial. So that's another issue. How are we going to implement a public trial um, and, and also deal with issues like security? I'm sure everybody heard of kind of Zoom bombing incidents. Courts had to make sure that wasn't going to happen to them. Uh, so between all of that, between, you know, different courts having different technology available to them, sometimes different courtrooms within the same courts having technology available, all of that made for a huge problem that um, courts have uh, been very creative uh, in working to solve. So let's kind of talk about real quick before I launch into what the courts are specifically doing. Um, I wanted to sh show kind of a continuum of the different platforms that exist. Um, over on the left here, we have uh, what we kind of call amongst ourselves like static platforms that don't have a native um, simultaneous capability. And that if you're going to do simultaneous with these apps like Teams or Google Hangouts, GoToMeeting, WebEx that a lot of courts are using, you are going to have to add something on on top like an extra phone line or, a, or an additional system that the court may build or may have access to in order to do simultaneous. So it's gonna be platform plus something else. Then you have Zoom, which a lot of courts are implementing uh, that does have in-app uh, simultaneous capability. Uh, it's not without its, without its complications, but at least it does have that. 
And then over here on the far right are platforms that our conference interpreter colleagues are going to, going to be very familiar with that are purpose designed for simultaneous, but yet probably don't have the functionality that we would need in courts because of the need to have so many people on video at the same time able to interact with the court. So these ones on the right have not really been something that, that courts to my knowledge have been um, considering seriously. It's been more to the ones to the left of the spectrum and different solutions within that um, to make their simultaneous or just even regular consecutive interpreted hearings um, happen. So let's look real quick at the federal courts and what they're doing. So one thing that I want to address first is that the federal district courts across the entire country, they're not a monolith and there's not one body that says, um, like, for example, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, that body doesn't go and say, okay, uh, federal district courts across America, uh, you're going to do it this way. Each court, uh, each district and each court can make those decisions. Uh, and so what we then see is a variety of solutions that are designed to reflect the caseloads and case compositions of each court. Like down on the border, the case volume is much higher. Uh, than maybe further north or in the center of the country. And so those courts have, on the border have actually had to develop quicker simultaneous solutions and have not been able to simply just go, well, we only have maybe two interpreted hearings uh, a month, and so we're just going to do everything all consecutive. So I would say that a general trend that we've been noticing is that border courts have been quicker to implement solutions that uh, allow for, for, for simultaneous. And so what we're seeing is, um, first of all, a lot of the, a number of the federal courts have um, a, the, the telephone interpreting program or TIP uh, system. It's, uh, it's uh, basically, Ernest will explain it, he'll show you a picture, but effectively it allows interpreters, staff interpreters within the federal courts to interpret simultaneously over the phone. So you use two different phones and then switch between them. Um, so that's something that the federal courts have access to that was built, purpose built for the courts. Uh, some courts are also using uh, Zoom. Um, some of them are using it with consecutive only. Uh, some of them are using it with the simultaneous feature. And then uh, based on our conversations, this is not the result of an exhaustive survey, but our conversations with colleagues uh, and friends around the country, we're seeing that they're using any of these uh, below options. They're a, a video teleconferencing system plus something else like a phone line, Jabber, Microsoft Teams, um, you know, FaceTime maybe at the very beginning was something some courts were experimenting with and then they abandoned that because not everybody has access to technology. A lot of courts are using WebEx. And I mean, anything that you can possibly imagine, I think is the conclusion that I, that I want to leave you with. Anything that you can imagine, any possible configuration is something that is being tried um, and that courts are, are beginning to kind of settle on as, as a possibility. The other thing that's important to realize is that configuration, configurations in presence also vary significantly. Sometimes everyone is remote except maybe the court clerk that's handling the recording from the courtroom. Uh, sometimes everybody's there in the courtroom um, socially distanced within an enormous courtroom, except the defendant, which is in, who is in a detain, uh, detainment facility, and the interpreter is uh, interpreting to that person over a phone line. Uh, so we see a lot of different things, basically. Um, state courts, uh, a lot of the solutions are similar, but the challenges are different. Um, because the caseloads are so much more varied. Um, state courts are going to be doing family law, which federal courts never do. Uh, and so that means that's a, that's a totally different caseload and, um, and state courts are also going to therefore have much larger caseloads because they're de dealing with every range of possible issues that the community has. And so access is, is something that state courts really think about a lot. And so one of the th some of the solutions have been um, you know, maybe just having people call in audio only, which usually means difficult for simultaneous, uh, but possible um, over multiple phone lines. Uh, we're seeing things like courts setting up spaces, dedicated spaces for people to access technology uh, because courts realize that, you know, just because you don't have a laptop at home doesn't mean that it means that the court needs to accommodate you because your access to technology doesn't shouldn't mediate your access to justice. So um, courts are coming up with creative solutions to make, this, to make this possible. And we're seeing really interesting stuff. Like there was a jury trial held a couple of weeks ago over Zoom in Texas. So courts are experimenting and we're seeing how they're going um, over time. And just real quick, um, kind of internationally, 
what we're seeing. Um, this is kind of a roundup of headlines. I really want to encourage you all to check out remotecourts.org. It is absolutely fascinating. It's constantly being updated. I think that people, you can kind of independently contribute articles. So it's a clearinghouse of articles and news from courts around the world. This one at the top was one of our favorites. Um, the commercial court here is $530 million case versus via Zoom. And everybody thought it was going to be an absolute c catastrophe because there was there were interpreters. It was like the Bank of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the Bank of Kazakhstan suing over a seizure of assets or a, fro a freezing of assets, I think it was. And, but they made it work. They got it all together and uh, they had an interpreted trial and everybody was very impressed at how, how well it went. Um, but I think what I wanted to kind of indicate with this kind of part of the presentation is just, we are the whole world figuring this out right now. And, um, and what's interesting is through sites like remotecourts.org, through other clearinghouses, I've seen webinars where judges from across the states, across the entire United States have gotten together and shared their practices in very different jurisdictions, Texas, New Jersey, um, getting together and talking about what they're doing. Um, and so I think that this is kind of a, a moment, you know, where we're, where we're sharing and, and improving in some ways um, access to justice, I think. Um, so I wanted to launch a poll just to see um, what your experience has been, um, if you know uh, whether courts have interpreted or are implementing remote hearings with interpretation. Okay, so, so I'm seeing a lot of, I don't know actually about half so far, um, and then with consecutive and simultaneous interpretation are kind of um, neck and neck close behind, but with consecutive uh, kind of ahead, which is exactly what I would expect because we're seeing a lot of, especially in state courts right now, a lot of um, consecutive only. And it feels like what we're seeing is, is um, a, a turning to simultaneous bit by bit um, across the, the U.S. outside the border area. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe give it another few seconds. It's slowing down. So let's go ahead and turn it around and let everybody kind of see. So um, a little bit more on the consec side and consecutive and simultaneous, and then about half of you don't know, which is completely not surprising considering uh, the, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of information about this and it's really uh, evolving. Okay, so our takeaways from this part is that I just wanted to say again, courts have really unique needs and it makes it hard to, to implement this, but there has been a lot of flexibility and creativity uh, and, you know, and, and it's interesting because in this time, it depends on the ingenuity of the people involved, the interpreters, the court staff, the judges, um, court users even. And we really think that this innovation and creativity will continue. And we think that there is a silver lining in all of this, uh, this kind of COVID disruption, because this practice of remote interpreting, it happened before, but not well, not always well. And now we all have to do it. And so we can all make it better. Um, so at this point, I will go ahead and hand it over to Ernest to talk about his specific solutions. And I will exit out of my screen share. Excellent. Thank you, Tambor. And give me a second to get my screen share going. So I'm going to be piggybacking on what Tambor discussed, giving a little bit more detail to some of the specific simultaneous solutions that I've encountered thus far during the pandemic. Um, and then at the end, segueing to Amy's point where we start to think about what comes next and what is the role of interpreters in these discussions. So the outline, details on the different setups. We'll get, reflect a little bit on what my experience has been. I also wanna look into the technical and ethical considerations of different simultaneous systems and then discuss what comes next. And so let's start with purpose-built simultaneous platforms. This is an example and everything that I see here uh, is shared with permission. This is a civil mediation session that I interpreted simultaneously over Zoom and with permission took this picture. The gentleman in the top left corner is the plaintiff's attorney. The gentleman in the bottom left is the mediator. And 
This is the famous toggle switch that you have when you are interpreting simultaneously over Zoom that allows you to switch your output between the people listening in English and the people listening in Spanish. And so because this was a relatively small meeting, I didn't had fewer moving pieces. The, the two gentlemen to my left were listening in English and the gentleman in the bottom right corner who declined to be um, identified was listening in Spanish. And that was something that the attorney, he was actually within the attorney's office, but in a separate room that the attorney had a computer in, had it all set up, set to the channel that he needed to be on. So he literally sat him down in front of the computer, put on the headset, and we were off and running. So this would be an example of a simultaneous platform uh, that I was able to use that again, offered very smooth, simple, simultaneous, at least once you're in it. The, the setup and what it takes to get a good Zoom meeting going and simultaneous is a, a topic for another day. Um, we did 90 minutes on it for, for another webinar recently and have a lot to say about it. But I also wanted to share another very streamlined, efficient setup for simultaneous, which is the TIP, Telephonic Interpreting Program, um, setup that an interpreter has that he is able to use out of his home. Most of these are used within courthouses, but there are, I've been told, five interpreters who have a, a telephonic interpreting setup out of their house. And the nice thing about it is you can see so immediately underneath the lamp, there are two phones that are hooked into this thing that looks like a mixer. And this is a custom built piece of equipment. You cannot buy it off of the shelf in any situation. And so it allows you to have both your inputs and your outputs from two different phone lines. And by turning a knob on here, you're able to control where your output is going. It's either going to the entire courtroom over the speakers in the courtroom or wherever you're, you're being listened to, or it's going into headsets that the um, LEP party has on that only they are privy to what you are interpreting. Now, I say that, and, and even that that I just told you assumes that somebody is in a courtroom that has integrated audio. So that is a pre-pandemic framework. Uh, there have been adaptations made to this, but this can work out to any, basically any phone line. And so this is not something that I have personal experience with, but I think the technology is amazing. And if you, you can see the different devices, that would be, for example, for being able to have an IM going instant messaging uh, conversation with the, somebody in the courtroom, if there's any sort of an issue or having access to documents like an indictment to be able to refer to or, or as needed, uh, refer to a code section or something that comes up. And so now let's get into what my actual experience was in, in court or in court adjacent work. And so this is an, an image from my local jail um, because as of about the middle of March, they banned in-person meetings. Basically anybody that wasn't uh, in handcuffs was, or worked there wasn't allowed in anymore. And so attorneys now had to utilize their video visiting system to meet with their clients. And so I quickly tried to make an account. Again, this is shared with permission from the attorney. The attorney is the one you can see immediately above me and the um, faces of the uh, inmates are obscured to protect their privacy. Um, I would say to protect the innocent, but this guy may have since pled guilty. So I guess we could say to protect the guilty. Um, so the initial setup was I created an account and, and right away ran into a really interesting situation, which was the jail didn't want to con give me, confer me confidential status, which means the right to not have my video calls monitored. And so you can, this is very early on. I can tell partially by my hair. That's how I can tell time with the pandemic. But also I can tell because it says monitored and recorded. So that means that this call was not confidential and it could have been subject to um, monitoring by the facility, which is an issue for attorney-client privilege. Uh, big deal here. And so I had to go back and forth with them a bit and have a discussion about the fact that really I was an extension of the attorney. And so even though that the policy on paper was only attorneys get confidential status, because here I was acting as an extension of the attorney and facilitating privileged conversation, uh, they should give it to me. And eventually, I think they just got tired of arguing with me over email. And I was always very pleasant. I didn't have to ever escalate it and have the attorney make a fuss about it. And so they did eventually give me confidential status to not have uh, calls that I was interpreting monitored. But this is just one example of the issues sort of, um, how to put it, 
unforeseen issues that can arise when suddenly multi lots of different people, stakeholders, including interpreters, are thrust into this platform that really exists for people's family members to come and, and talk to them because they're not allowed in-person visits. Um, and so that's why they are monitored. And so this was um, the attorney that I was working with and the initial setup was just a conventional, you know, the left side of the spectrum for that slide that Tambor showed, which means we were, everybody could hear everything, the attorney spoke, I interpreted, completely static uh, consecutive interpretation. And so we moved away from that eventually with the attorney and actually it was, it was the attorney's initiative because I was willing to go along and do consecutive because in real life, an attorney client meeting is something where I rarely would have equipment, it would be done consecutively. But the, the thing about this platform, and this is very unique to a, a video platform that is used by a jail or a detention facility, you don't have control over your microphone and you have a strict time limit. Literally from the time you log on to, it's called iWeb, from the moment you log on to iWeb, you have a countdown clock in the top of the screen. And so you were literally on the clock and are limited in, for example, muting yourself like you could in Zoom. And so the attorney actually came up with a very, I thought, ingenious solution, which was he silenced himself. He silenced his microphone and he silenced his speakers on his computer not through the app, but he had to do it at a system level in the control panel of the, he uses Windows. And so you can actually silence your microphone system wide, but you've got to go and mess with your computer settings. Yet this particular program doesn't allow you to do it natively. And then, so basically he was on the video call just for images, just for visuals. He and I had a phone connection. So he and I were speaking on the phone and you see this set of headphones that I've put on myself because that setup necessitates an additional piece of equipment for the interpreter. The, the interpreter now is in between the video visit with the defendant and this phone call that they have going with the attorney. And so I wanna actually break that down in, in more technical terms um, so that it makes sense because it's hard to just discuss. And the reason I'm having to superimpose the headphones here is because the screenshot originally is from before the attorney and I were doing this setup. And I've since been able to do it with other, other attorneys from his office. And so this is where we get into, I guess you could call it hacking a platform that doesn't allow simultaneous. And so the, the official title that I'm giving it, and this is not a thing, I, I personally refer to it as pirate simultaneous, but to be more technical, we'll say it's improvised simultaneous. And so big picture, what you're trying to do is take people, that are in one, we'll call it a room. So everybody that speaks English is on a go-to meeting or is on a Zoom meeting with no simultaneous enabled or is just on a phone conference. Whatever it is, all of them are in some virtual space where they can communicate. And likewise, you create a second space and we're just using English and Spanish for our purposes here today. You create a second space, likewise, a virtual space where everybody who speaks Spanish or whatever the non-English language is, is either communicating by video or by phone, and the interpreter places themselves in the middle. The interpreter basically has access to both virtual spaces through either a single device running two programs in parallel or two devices. And so that can be two phones or that can be a phone and a computer uh, running a video, one of the video chat programs or a computer running VOIP. So when I do double telephonic, for example, I have my actual phone and I have my computer uh, making a call through Google Voice. And so the interpreter, the thing that's important to highlight about this is that in this situation, the interpreter becomes the choke point, right? The interpreter is the bottleneck. Everything that the Spanish room hears runs through the interpreter and vice versa. And so the, the rooms do not hear each other, which has implications, which we'll now discuss on the next slide. And there's the interpreter is having to, to move between rooms, the interpreter is having to somehow um, operate their devices, which we'll now see. And so again, we have our two rooms and we have the interpreter. So when somebody from the English room is speaking, the interpreter is interpreting that simultaneously into the Spanish room through whatever device they are connected with that room on. But to enable fluid simultaneous and to not cause audio 
interference in the original room that the audio is coming from, they have to mute themselves on whatever device they are on in that room. And so if I'm on a go-to meeting with the English people and that's on my computer, I need to mute either through my microphone or through the computer itself, mute myself when I am doing simultaneous from that room. And it flips when it's going the other way. The interpreter is now getting their input from the Spanish room, meeting, teleconference, whatever it is, going into English, but muting their microphone into the Spanish room so that the people in that room are not hearing themselves be interpreted into English while they are speaking. And so it's, it's a very complicated setup. And if, if this is the first time that you are exposed to it, it, it may not completely make sense. Um, but for, we've tried to simplify it as much as possible. And so it, it sounds overwhelming and it certainly can be in certain situations. But if you think through and practice a setup, once you're actually executing it, it does not have to be a complete burden. And so let's, let's talk about this. So let's really talk about the implications and what this means to be doing improvised simultaneous where you are hacking somehow a platform that doesn't actually allow um, simultaneous. We talked about how the interpreter is the choke point. And so the, the people in Spanish do not hear the English. And so if, for example, people start talking, if, if the interpreter takes a pause to take a breath and they read that that means that the interpretation is done and that it's their time, turn to speak now, then they can start talking and it's, it becomes really hard to manage because the interpreter is kind of conditioned to be muting and unmuting. And so it, it can be hard to get everybody's attention all at once. It, it can certainly be done, but it's challenging. It can be challenging for bilingual or multilingual parties who want to hear what is being said in the other language. And so for an attorney or a judge, for example, and this is more of an issue along the border here in the US, for an attorney or a judge who wants to hear the Spanish to do quality control on the interpretation, they themselves within this setup would have to have a second device and be in that other room. Now, cognitive load is a big consideration. And there are diff that what I mean is interpreting is hard enough on its own in a perfect setting, in a comfortable chair, in a booth with a console. But you know, sitting at your desk and juggling, muting and unmuting potentially two different devices in sync adds to what you're having to process. And so this is part of the reason that people say that RSI should be charged actually at a higher rate, not a lower rate than what you are doing live in person, um, or there should be greater breaks. And that's a whole other discussion that I think has been covered in other sessions. But that is definitely a consideration because you're juggling devices. And also one thing that I have done to help mitigate this is to set it up to where I am only doing simultaneous one way. And that depends on the type of proceeding. If it's a proceeding like a guilty plea in federal court, you can manage that because what's going from Spanish to English is gonna be yes, no, very short answers that are not gonna throw your timing off necessarily to just do them consecutively. And then you're saving yourself the trouble of, of having to mute one way in that um, situation. And then scope of practice, you know, we're hired to interpret. And so the court may ask for your input on their setup, but if they say devise a simultaneous setup for us, that's not necessarily something that you sh should or need to take on. I want to very briefly talk about a setup that I had in, in my local court here federally, which was initially everybody was in the same room. And so when what you see to the left, where you see judge, defense, prosecution, interpreter, that was everybody actually within the same four walls in the same space. And so this is a, kind of breaks the mold of remote simultaneous because it's only partially remote. And so initially we were just doing a static video conference. And so there was a video connection to the jail. Judge would say something, I would interpret it. Completely consecutive, completely static. Uh, of their own volition, they came up with a different solution whereby I was on my phone, again, still in the courtroom, still within, you know, not six feet, but still within a long arm's reach of the parties so that I could get my input from the speakers in the courtroom. I didn't have to manage a different device to be hearing what the judge was saying. Uh, I was, they were on a video call to the jail that was muted and silenced. And so the connection between, the video connection between the courtroom and the jail was visual only. And I was calling in from my, from the bench, from the table they had for me. I was calling into that same video meeting from my phone 
to be able to do simultaneous for the defendant. And so the nice thing about this setup was because I was only doing it one way, I didn't have to mute. It basically turned my phone into my transmitter. Um, I'm going to have to skip for time this next slide, but it will be in the slides and I can add a narrative of it, which is the latest permutation of the same setup whereby they have a Zoom meeting, again, not simultaneous Zoom, but doing simultaneous to a phone now that the defendant has. And so the defendant now has two devices, the computer and the phone. And so I wanna now deploy my poll to get your input on what you all have actually been doing among these options. Tambor, you're muted. There we go. And so let's take a look. Out of 800 people now, it looks like we've done some Zoom simultaneous, some parallel improvised uh, simultaneous, or you could call it pirate simultaneous, multiple phone lines, um, very few that have done uh, a situation like TIP through the federal courts, which is wonderful. That's our staff interpreters that are on the uh, meeting. And then the majority so far who have not interpreted sim simultaneously remotely um, since the beginning of the pandemic. That's great. So I think we've got enough to get a, to get a feel for where people are with that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and shut down the poll. Go ahead and you can see the results really quickly. And so we see a smattering of of some different platforms and then the majority who have not done this. And that's great. This is a, a perfect session to get a feel for what's out there and to be ready for what could be thrown in your path, as it were. Um, and the one thing that I'm going to share for one minute before I pass this off to Amy is an image. And I guess we can say that this is going to be a teaser for you all. What comes next, we're gonna talk about what comes next as far as RSI and how much of this sticks after the pandemic. But what comes next immediately for many of us is gonna be interpreting in person again and figuring out how to do that safely. And so this is a, a, an image from two of my colleagues up in Hennepin County, Minnesota, uh, who interpreted a jury trial last week. So there was a jury, they were interpreting, they had microphones actually attached to their throats so they did not have to take off their face masks. And so that is the next conversation that is happening. And I think Amy's session or Amy's section here is gonna give us a lot of tools to think about how do interpreters involve themselves in those conversations to get a seat at the table for that. And I will be sending in with the follow-up materials, I will be sending additional materials like links uh, and resources about that. So I'm sorry to leave you wanting more with that, but that can be another session in the future. So thank you very much and I'll pass it off to Amy. Amy, you're muted. Okay, so this section here is all about the best practices and what we've learned in all of our experiences here. And what I would like to say, sorry, I think I managed to, is that what COVID has done for us feels a lot like, sorry, I'm, I don't, I don't, you're seeing my presenter view, aren't you? Correct. Is it because it's in a protected view? Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh my God. Here we go. All right, here we go. So this is pretty much how I think we feel about what life is like right now with COVID-19, right? How many of us would plan to have our house burned down? I don't think any of us, right? That's not something you can really plan for. You can try to have an evacuation plan. You can think about what you would do in case this were to happen, but it's really not quite the same as having everything come tumbling down around you, right? So this pandemic has really been a true test for all of us. And it's caught us off guard and, and a lot of times it's caught us unprepared. Um, just like was mentioned by Tambor and by Ernest, there are, are remote solution, uh, solutions that have been used in the past, but they were not with this same scenario in mind, not with every single person, including the judge, also being remote in cases of court interpreting. 
Um, in cases before with depositions, we might have had one attorney appearing remotely, but everybody else was all in the same space. So I just want to take a minute and, and acknowledge the fact that we're dealing with, with what has really been an emergency and just acknowledge too that we've all been really trying to do the best we can with whatever, whatever tools are at our disposal. And those tools have been limited, like Tambor mentioned, because of a lot of administrative uh, reasons and also logistics. You know, if, if the jail doesn't have a setup uh, that would make simultaneous uh, interpreting possible, that's going to be a limiting factor right there. So again, to go back to this analogy of a house being on fire, if your house is on fire and your neighbor hands you their garden hose, are you going to complain and say, you know what, I really like those black industrial strength hoses, this green garden hose? No, you're not going to stop and, and nitpick those kinds of details. You're going to start with what you've got and you're going to try to do the best you can until the firefighters arrive, right? So of course, we're dealing with an imperfect situation, but that doesn't mean we have to stay and use an ins insufficient uh, resource uh, or situation in the long run, right? Okay. So a lot of the situations Ernest mentioned show resourcefulness, but they really aren't meant to be used in the long run. So we really want to differentiate between what we're seeing now and what best practices are because they really might not be the same thing. So needless to say, this is a bewildering time and we need to figure out where we go from here. So as the courts are going to be opening back up, um, to a certain extent, remote appearances are probably still going to be occurring. In a lot of the courts uh, that I've seen and some locally here, even though the court is opening up for participants, uh, for uh, defendants to come back into the courtroom, they're still allowing for the attorneys and other parties to appear remotely. Um, and again, we're also hearing that there's a possibility of a resurgence or what, what would happen if there were a spike in cases and that might lead to other, other issues in the, in the future as, as far as needing to, to have these remote solutions. So we need to be prepared uh, in case this is going to be used in the future, even if it's not to the same extent or as exclusively as we've been seeing now. And so one thing that we need to do in, in shaping this conversation is think about every single profession has its necessary equipment. So you wouldn't see a construction worker being asked to work without a helmet. You don't see a doctor being asked to work without their stethoscope. So we also need to acknowledge that there are certain things that interpreters simply need to be able to function, to be able to do our job, and to be able to do it to the best of our ability. And you know, this, this webinar series is all about you know, a remote simultaneous interpreting, and we're focusing right now on court and, and legal situations, all the more so when someone's life or liberty or their money is at stake, right? Um, we need to be able to do our job and provide that access to justice, um, just like Tambor had mentioned. So if we think about some of our, our colleagues that we see in court, um, when I say colleagues, other people who are, are working within the justice system ourself, like ourselves, we see that court reporters might have all different setups and we might see that a court reporter comes to a deposition and doesn't have the best possible chair, but you're never going to see a court reporter standing up because it simply is not going to be feasible for what they have to do for their job, right? We know that they have their limitations of what can and cannot be done. So we have to draw the line somewhere. And I, I felt like this image of drawing a line in the sand, I think really says it all, right? Because when you draw the line in the sand, you're saying, this is the point of no return. Like this is the point where I will not cross this line. This is what I need. And, and that's a conversation that has to be had as far as, as interpreters, as colleagues, we have to decide for ourselves at what point um, are these solutions feasible in the long run, right? And when your house is on fire, you're doing the best you can because, you know, cases have to continue on, but how is this going to work going forward? So these more permanent solutions are going to have to include the following. We have to have the ability to see and hear all parties. Now for conference interpreting, that might not be the case, but for legal situations, it definitely changes the situation. I don't know how many of you have had the situation of, of just being that choke point where your only access to someone has been via a phone call or audio connection. Um, the ability to, to be seen and to see them makes, makes that uh, choke point 
situation a lot more feasible um, because you can actually, if it's consecutive, remind the parties that you have to interpret, right? Um, in some cases, like with juvenile court, where the parents are the only ones receiving interpretation, uh, it's possible that the judges forget that you need to, to be able to interpret. So the, being able to be seen as well as to see and hear the parties is an important consideration. And also looking for a program and a solution that already has simultaneous capabilities built in. Um, even within the chat, I saw a lot of conversation talking about cognitive load. The idea of having to go between two different devices while we're making it work, right? And, and these are things that, that are happening in, in an emergency situation. Thinking about this long-term, thinking about best practices, we want to find a solution that's not going to add to our cognitive load. Because as it is, um, we're dealing with a difficult situation um, if we can see or hear people. Also, the ability to do team interpreting. Interpreting remotely has its own challenges. The audio quality is not usually the, the same as we have when we're in person. The ability to, to interrupt and, and ask people to repeat themselves if something gets lost, if their, um, if their equipment cuts out, things like that, those are all going to, to wear down um, our, our ability to concentrate. So that having a program and, and having the setup to be able to do team interpreting is a must. And also receiving good sound quality. Um, we need to have ability to protect ourselves from acoustic shock, but even more so, and perhaps more insidiously, is the damage by exposure to increasing volumes. And especially when the audio quality is bad and we tend to crank up the volume to try to make up for that, that poor audio quality. Um, there's a study, and we'll be sharing this um, in the follow-up information, uh, a link to the study that was done by NIMSI, um, or excuse me, perhaps it was shared by NIMSI, about the hearing loss being an, an absolute possibility because of, of being exposed to higher volumes. So this is something that in the long run, I mean, it's very difficult for an interpreter to interpret if you can't hear. And so we have to look out for ourselves in the long run and think about our audio protection just the same as someone else would have a helmet or other kind of personal protective gear, um, like we saw in the, uh, the earlier slide about PPE. So right now I'd like to ask if we can launch this poll to find out how involved interpreters have been in your area um, in helping to shape the RSI remote situation. No, I'm sorry, that's the wrong poll. It's poll number three. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of folks are unaware or not involved at all. And we do have a very a different, um, we have two different yeses, right? Very involved, but whether the, the courts sought out that participation or whether the interpreters took the initiative. But what we're seeing is that a lot of folks are not aware or not involved. We'll give it another, another few seconds here. Okay, let's go ahead and share that. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a lot of interpreters are not necessarily being asked, but are having to take the initiative and are only somewhat involved. It looks like for the most part, either interpreters don't know or are not involved at all. And then that's, that's problematic, right? Because how can we find a solution um, if it's, if we're not being asked, right? As every profession needs its specific um, gear, specific um, tools, we need to know what that is. So what can we do to change that? What can we do as interpreters to advocate for better conditions for, for interpreting? One thing would be is to be in close contact with our professional associations, such as NAGIT, ATA. I know there are several participants from many different countries. And so be in contact with your professional associations and work to help create standards and protocols that are going to best fit with your local jurisdiction. Um, just like Tambor mentioned, what we're seeing throughout the United States, there are so many different setups because the logistics and the needs vary so much from one court to another and even from one courtroom to another, even within the same court. Um, so understanding what these conditions are and what and helping to advocate for what we need to be able to do our job. 
And I would like to also kind of reframe the conversation. So HR and employers understand that ergonomics is important for their employees, right? And so you see that they'll buy standing desks, they'll buy correct chairs that, that provide the correct positioning. All of these things, according to um, the, this source found at humanscale.com regarding ergonomics, it defines that ergonomics is aimed to increase efficiency, but it also is aimed to reduce discomfort. And I would go so far as to say, it also is aimed at preventing injury. And so being that interpreters are tools that we need are our ears, right? Our minds and our ability to speak. If we lose our hearing, um, that can be a direct consequence of working under you know, suboptimal conditions, or I might even say poor conditions. So I think if we, if we start framing this, not only as a, a tool that we need as professionals, but also using the, the terminology that perhaps employers even understand, that this is an, an issue of ergonomics as well and preventing injury. Um, so again, we will share the, the study regarding hearing loss and acoustic shock um, that was uh, disseminated by NIMSI. So let's think about this. How connected are we in this RSI discussion? Are there ways that we can find ourselves more involved, that we can involve ourselves more within our courts, within our own, with our own clients? Because the more connected we are with this discussion, the better it will be to be able to find the right solutions. We need to be the missing link. Just like this puzzle you see in this image, if we're not included, then it's going to be an incomplete solution. It's going to be an incomplete picture. But if we can at least find ways to, to insert our needs and our issues into that, then we can be the ones to help bring the solutions. And again, we do have to find ways to be firm and to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, these are the minimum requirements that I need to do my job as an interpreter, right? Whether that be using consecutive um, in, instead of simultaneous because the simultaneous uh, solutions are not appropriate, we have to figure out what, what that line is and then what we're not willing to go past. So that's, that's where, where we have to make sure that we're part of the discussion. So with that, I'm concluding my section here and I would like to share our contact information before we go into our question and answer session. Um, you can find us on Twitter, but you can also find us, uh, the three of us at training at tealanguagesolutions.com. And I thank you very much for um, all of your participation, comments, and we look forward to answering your questions right now. Well, greetings um, to all of you. I have to say there are, are dozens of questions. Um, we'll prioritize what we can. Uh, feel free to contact us afterwards if your question isn't answered. I am uh, Marjorie Bancroft, your host. I'm going to uh, join the video feed and jump right in uh, with first question uh, to all of you. What does native, I think though it actually came uh, for you, Tamber, what does native mean in the platform's context? Oh, that what we mean by that is that the platform has a built-in simultaneous capability. Like, so uh, uh, Microsoft Teams does not have multiple channels for to, to allow for um, English in one and some other language in the other channel. So that's, 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 one that, that's an example of one that does not have native simul. Zoom has it built in so that if you enable the simultaneous feature in your account and then in the, in the meeting, then you can assign someone as an interpreter and that person can interpret simultaneously without the whole extra phone line and all of that stuff that, that Ernest was talking about in his improvised simul. So um, having native simul means that you have it built in and you don't have to hack it. Super, thank you. Um, someone commented you're missing Skype for business on the, on, on the list, um, and that's what New York State courts are currently using, but courts across the country, I guess, are just finding what they can uh, do. Um, so that was just a comment. Someone is actually asking what Zoom bombing means, and it's so important for the courts, if one of you would like to elaborate. <laughs> Sure, I, I can take that and then I'll let Amy finish off. So Zoom bombing is where you basically invade somebody else's Zoom meeting uh, and then because you are enabled and, and this can be a, um, 
issue on the part of the host and not in managing their settings correctly. But if you are allowed to screen share or share audio, you would take over the video feed and be sharing some violent or offensive con content or saying something objectionable, basically hijacking the meeting. Go ahead, Amy. Oh, no, just uh, again, it's, it's, it's really about the settings and somebody jumping on and doing something they shouldn't be doing when their video is enabled. Yeah, and, and that, that kind of brings up the, the issue of security um, in Zoom that I exactly. think was that that question was asked um, ahead of the ahead of the webinar. And um, I'm not none of us are IT experts, uh, but we've followed uh, Zoom's security blog pretty closely. And some of the major issues were Zoom were, were kind of Zoom bombings type stuff, which is settings issues. Zoom fixed that uh, so that a lot of the security settings are now default. Uh, it, another issue was encryption. They upped their encryption. It's still not end-to-end -end because it's actually very technically complex to do true end-to-end. -end. And then the other thing that they've done is they've stopped uh, routing information through China. Like you actually have to route the, you actually have to opt in to uh, route information through China. So that's what they have published. I'm getting that information directly from Zoom's security blog. So I'm, I don't have access to any third-party testing information that I am aware of, except what was originally done by um, Citizen Lab in Toronto. They did a really great job, but they only, they also did, said that they specifically said that they didn't look at ZoomGov and they didn't look at, um, I think, Zoom HipHop. So they were looking at the off-the-shelf Zoom at the time when they sort of and took took it all apart. And Heidi just asked a question in the chat, and this is what I was going to piggyback on, is that uh, at least that I'm aware of, federal courts who are using Zoom are using a special build called ZoomGov. Yeah. And so that is not commercially available off the shelf to an individual consumer like you or myself. That is something that has, uh, they, they say it has more uh, robust security features. It's certified with Homeland Security as far as the security features. And so that's a caveat is that the, the discussion that we're having about Zoom for the consumers at large does not necessarily apply to what courts are implementing. But I've certainly heard people say, oh, well, courts can't use Zoom because of the security issues and they're not aware of Zoom to, uh, gov. that is for sure. Um, I know you've, you've touched on these things, but the, it, went, it went by quickly. Uh, someone has asked how to manage when both witness and defendant need an interpreter in a hearing simultaneous for defendant and consecutive for witness. Um, do you need two interpreters? <laughs> I, I, I laugh because the last webinar I gave was literally about that. It was, called, <laughs> okay. it was called, is this seat taken about the different places where you and your partner would sit throughout the courtroom, depending on whether you're interpreting at the, at the table or both at the bench with a witness. Um, and so I, off, off hand, I can't say I've thought about that that much because I haven't had to do really anything involving heavy duty testimony um, yet, but I don't know. Let's think through this, guys. You would obviously be implementing some sort of, uh, if you were doing simultaneous, you would be interpreting the question. You could not do... Uh, you would be interpreting the question potentially simultaneously and then the answer, if, they, if both this person listening and the witness speak the same language, they don't need the question interpreted, they can hear it in the original language. And so it would, the typical interpreter answer, it depends. It would really depend on physically where they were also, because if they're both in the courtroom versus having them both be participating uh, remotely, that would also affect, and, and the platform that you use. So, sorry, roundabout answer. <laughs> so going to be a lot more of this confusion coming, I'm sure. Uh, someone says, I don't understand how interpreting can be in the simultaneous mode when doing Zoom and everyone is listening. It's like t talking, two people talking at the same time and it creates confusion. I'm I'll sure let, you can I'll let, Yeah, I'll let one of the, my colleagues take that. Yeah, that's, that's the great thing. The fact that it actually has separate channels. And so the interpreter interface, once you're scheduled as an interpreter in Zoom, that's the great thing is that you're able to, to go back and forth between the different language channels and the program, because it is built in, it, it automatically knows if you're speaking into one language, then the other language shouldn't hear you. So they can continue speaking without being interrupted by the interpreter. But again, the folks in the other virtual space um, also have to not be interrupting. Uh, so it's, it's, there's part of it is crowd management in muting people when they're not supposed to be speaking um, when the interpreter is interpreting to them, but then again, the person who is being in, interpreted, um, the, the source, can speak and the interpreter is able to hear and, and interpret that with no uh, interference. It is a feature that's, that has to be activated. That's the main thing. You have to make sure that's in your account and in your meeting. 
and and one last question, but it's it's really a yes no question when using um, the simultaneous feature in Zoom, and the limited English proficient individual here is the interpreter. Can that individual communicate with the interpreter? Yes, yes they can. So. Yes they can. So the interpreter will have universal audio. So everybody else is kind of limited uh, to what they what channel they're on and whether where they're going to hear the interpreter. But the interpreter will hear absolutely everything all the time. So if there's a question from one side or the other, the interpreter is going to hear it automatically at full volume. Um, and, and in one last uh, parting comment, uh, someone says, in Oregon, we call the hacked method dual channel architecture. That's a term that is- That's unique. very fancy. <laughs> I love it. Dual channel. It makes it sound so much more advanced. Elegant than 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 hacked <laughs> method. Yes. Okay, more than just like, I have a cell phone and I have Google Hangouts and right. I'm going to make that work. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it sounds so official. <laughs> well, we, I, I've, I've noted in chat so many grateful responses. This was a webinar that really addressed such incredibly concrete, specific, complex issues and made them understandable for real people who are actually interpreting in courts or working with people interpreting courts. Um, the enthusiasm has been palpable. There are dozens and dozens of unanswered questions, so we may be hearing from people, but it has shown a real appetite and a real need for the information that you presented so coherently and cogently today uh, and with such panache as well. Thanks to all three of you from the heart. This was a really, really important presentation and you gave of your hearts and your substance and your experience so generously. We were very lucky to have you. Thanks and have a wonderful rest of your day.